I have to be honest. I don't know what's right or wrong anymore. And I don't even know if I want to do this anymore because the reality is when you're talking about weapons of mass destruction, it's not a joke. It's not a joke at all. And I had a thought. I was sitting there thinking about weapons of mass destruction. There's my pill chat. Okay, my pill chat wasn't showing up. And I thought, I wonder how the classification works. Do you guys want to know how nuclear weapon classification works? I don't care if you want to. You're going to find out right now in one way or another. So here we go. So I decided last night, you know what? We're going to go on a little quest. How exactly does classification actually work? I wasn't sure. So this is actually a really good document that talks about somebody who's actually worked, uh, I think, for the DOE. What did she say she works at? Oh, no, it's a guy. Um, so interestingly, part of how classification works, I'm going to summarize some of this and we'll look at some of it in detail. There are three levels of classification, uh, or maybe four. Uh, unclassified, classified, or top secret, secret, and un and classified or something like that and maybe unclassified so maybe like three or four characters when there's a document each paragraph in the document will have a different letter next to it so you can imagine a document that's got u or c or you know ts or whatever it is and the reason for this is that this makes it easy for them to like edit out parts of the document so they could say okay just remove all the top secret stuff from this document and then we can now declassify it we can now make it available to the public, which is actually really smart. And I started thinking about that. And I went, wow, okay. They've actually developed a classification system that is really hiding information, right? Because you imagine I write a story and now nine paragraphs of the story can just be pulled out just like that. And only people that have the right classification levels can even see those paragraphs. So now you've created a situation where information is being segmented away from people that would otherwise see it, right? And then all of that's arbitrary. Who's deciding whether or not something is a certain classification or another? So this article that I was reading here even mentions like, what about a situation where two people are talking to each other? What if the president talks to the, the director of national intelligence? Is that classified? And if it is, what level of classification is it set to? So now you can figure out like, oh, there's going to be a lot of arguments internally over what should be the classification of this or that. And while I was reading this, I realized the MH370 videos, no, there is no way anybody can talk about those videos. <laughs> like, holy shit, there is no way. Now it made, it made so much sense why nobody's talking about those videos because sources and methods are all classified you can't talk about anything about how they collect information which means gorgon stare which even means the other camera you're not allowed to talk about any of that stuff so even if you wanted to talk about the weaponry or what we did to the plane they can't talk about it because the videos themselves, the, the sources and methods themselves are censored. Those themselves are classified. Now, let's take a look at this. Another interesting thing, there's a lot of re really just interesting facts about this. It really helped give me like a more comprehensive understanding of what was going on. Um, oops, I just forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, they said that generally, what happens is that people will accumulate a lot of classified information in their heads. So the article says you accumulate all this information. And the problem is sometimes you'll accidentally reveal classified information because it's hard to remember all the different classifications on a document of this is classified at this level versus this is classified at this level. So I can talk about this, but I can't talk about that. So when leaks of classified information happen, it is common that it is incidental. And if it's an incidental leak of classified information, it's considered an administrative situation. What that means is that it's not a situation where you're going to go to jail. So most leaks of classified information are inadvertent. 
and inadvertent leaks are just administrative, like a slap on the wrist. Like, oh, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get deducted on your uh, promotion this year or whatever, right? Like that's basically what administrative means. Somebody, I see you guys are already wondering about Eddie, about Eddie Lynn. There's a little, there's something for this in here. So, so I thought, okay, well, that's interesting because Edward Lynn, the leaker of the MH370 videos, he got nine years in prison. He got nine years in prison, but I'm reading this document here and it says that most classified leaks are actually just an administrative thing. So for somebody to actually go to prison over it, it must be a really significant effort, right? And let's let's remember the Edward Lynn case. The government ended up having to admit that it was not really an espionage case. They ended up having to drop the charges related to espionage, and he ended up pleading guilty to dissemination of classified information. Dissemination of classified information is what Edward Lynn pled guilty to, which is relevant. That's what we're talking about right here. That's what we're talking about right here. So if I scroll down, oh yeah, okay, so it's actually S, C, and T, S. I got the letters wrong. S for secret, C for confidential, and T, S for top secret. So you can imagine these paragraphs that have all these letters near them. Now, this is also interesting. Who decides? It turns out Obama, <laughs> Obama himself is the one that has authored the most recent declassification guidelines which is executive order 13256. Actually, I think this is wrong, right? Isn't this 13526? Isn't that what the real one is? Maybe I'm looking at a different one. So it says, authority to take certain actions, say the existence of a weapons program. I mean, this is, I'm just going to read this out to you. Pay attention, guys. It's story time. You ready for this? Authority to take certain information, say the existence of a weapon program, and to classify it top secret is given only to specific individuals, including the president and the vice president and certain agency heads. Wow. So if we developed a super weapon, if we developed a weapon that was either a nuke or like, you know, a fusion bomb nuke, like we're seeing in the MH370 videos or something related to nuclear weapons, it would require basically the president of the United States to classify it. So if we developed an aneutronic fusion implosion bomb, hypothetically speaking, basically Obama would have been had the one to classify it. So definitely Obama must know about this technology. He has to know about this technology. It also later mentions that the president has 100% access to all clearances. So if a document shows up on the president's desk, they can see every single word in the document. What this means is if there's an MH370 operation, even if it was conducted by the CIA, if that document shows up on the president's desk, he's going to see every single word. He's going to know why we did it. He's going to know the weapon that was used on it. He's going to know everything about it. So what that means is Obama definitely knows, chat. Obama definitely knows. And it also means that Trump probably knows too. I mean, we've already suspected that, but he probably knows too. So this is where, I'm not going to go to my splinter case right now, but this is where you can see here, it says that this is all basically determined by the Atomic Energy Act and the DOE. If this is true, then what if they updated the statutes? after they developed a new super weapon. Imagine that you've got regular nukes. And then all of a sudden, one day, you develop a wormhole weapon, a black hole. What did, what did Sal call it? A plasma disruption fusion weapon. Imagine you develop a plasma disruption fusion weapon, and now all of a sudden, you need new statutes to protect it because it doesn't, it doesn't classify under the existing statutes because it's too dissimilar from the existing weapons. What are the specific configurations and, and classifications for nuclear weapons from weapons of mass destruction? They have like 20 different categories of nuclear weapon sensitivity. They call them sigmas. 
Sigmas 1 through 20, for example. And uh, let me see. I took some notes, actually, but I want to show the, the big thing. So I had, first of all, just as normal, guys, I had no idea what to expect when I'm reading this, right? A lot of it's pretty mundane. Some of it's pretty scary. What I'll say as a summary is I found out that even theory is classified. The narrative that, like, you can talk about theory, no. Even nuclear weapon theory is classified. Like, you can't do anything related to nuclear weapons. And so, actually, I started realizing when I was reading this, like, you know what? I actually have to be careful about talking about making a black hole super weapon. Because if we push it too far, they might actually have real justification to come knocking on the door. <laughs> and, like, you know, if they want to, you know, put me in, get me in trouble, that'd be fine. So, here are the sigma categories explained right here. It says, sigma categories. Restricted data and or formerly restricted data in the following categories which concern design, manufacture, utilization of atomic weapons or utilization of atomic weapons or nuclear explosives. Here are the sigmas. Look at sigma one. Sigma one, chat. <laughs> Look at what sigma one says. The very first sigma on the list. Hydrodynamic. Theory of operation, and it calls out hydrodynamic. Chat, what does hydrodynamic mean? Who in the chat knows what they're referring to when they're talking about hydrodynamic? Oh, they're talking about magnetohydrodynamic. They're talking about plasma. That's what they're talking about right there. They're talking about magneto hydrodynamics. The first sigma. What does this mean? This means that the fear, the connection of plasma to nuclear weapons has to be really old. It must go back to the almost the origins of nuclear classification. Magneto hydrodynamics and plasma must go all the way back to the very beginnings of nuclear weapons. Purpose of tests. General nature of nuclear explosive tested. Somewhere in here, it also mentions like technical experiments of these weapons, which could, the MH370 videos could qualify as like a technical experiment of it. And it even mentions, like, in the classification, they talk about footage. I guess what I'm getting at is, when I was reading through this, I thought, you know what? They are recording every time they use one of these weapons. They're recording it. That's why they were recording MH370. They were recording it because they record every nuclear weapon test. They record every single nuclear weapon test. And all of them are classified. All of them are classified at the highest levels. Let's scroll down just a little bit more. This is where I just went, holy shit. What does Sigma 11 say, chat? What does Sigma 11 say? Information concerning inertial confinement fusion which reveals or indi is indicative of weapon data. I was just looking at this. I'm just absolutely dumbfounded. Because once again, I didn't know what I was going to expect. I wouldn't expect it to just be spelled out right in the policy. Spelled out. I thought it would be like coded language or, you know, you're going to have to dig to find the true. Yeah, nope, there it is right there. Boom. <laughs> wow. The data which is defined in section 11Y of the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended as all data concerning design, manufacture, or utilization of atomic weapons, the production of special nuclear material, or, wait for it, the use of special nuclear material in the production of energy <laughs> the 
uh, the use of special nuclear material in the production of energy. Right there. You want to know how are they keeping free energy secret from the world? How and why are they keeping fusion secret from the world? It's literally spelled out right there in the restricted data paragraph. Any fuel source, any fuel source that is nuclear-based that produces energy is classified. Energy, literal energy is classified under restricted data. It's not just, oh, the, the big booms are classified. No, literally production of energy is classified. This actually made me even wonder. It's possible. It's possible that the helium-3, the boron-11, the fuel sources in aneutronic fusion, they might be classified. And there's another, this is a crazy thought. This is pretty, this is, let's call this a stretch. There might be another fuel source. What if there's another fuel source that is not boron-11, that is not helium-3, that is an aneutronic fusion source that is used for thermonuclear weapons? And what if it's kept secret all the time everywhere because it is related to nuclear weapons? Somebody guessed it already. What would that be? What could that fuel source, have we heard of any other fuel sources that could be used potentially that we haven't seen a lot of data on, but that have been speculated with relation to nuclear weapons? There is one. Lithium. Lithium. I sprinkled a little lithium in there. Castle Bravo test. Sprinkled a little boron and lithium. When we added the lithium, to our boron, all of a sudden, the nuclear detonation went from six megatons to 15 megatons. This is documented by Richter in the Castle Bravo tests. So we know there's a connection to lithium to thermonuclear weapons. But when you look out there, there's almost no literature about it. But you can get Grok and AI to spit back. And in fact, it was Friedwart Winterberg's textbook. I, I'm, I'm so happy I read a thermonuclear weapons textbook. It just, it gave me so much clarity over a lot of this. His textbook says, if you add a lithium, lithium to your deuterium reaction, you can basically get a chain reaction that just per keeps persisting. Do you get what I'm saying? As in, add a little lithium to your thermonuclear detonation, and the byproducts filter back in and they cause the reaction to just keep going. 